Aloha and welcome to Lillian's Vegan World. I'm your host, Lillian Kumik. Today's show is COVID booster shots and Del Delta virus, COVID-19 101 and vaccine update, brought to you by ThinkTech Hawaii. I'd like to introduce my regular guest on the show, Dr. Grace Chen O'Neill. Aloha, Dr. O'Neill. Hi, everyone. Hi, Lillian. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the show. And first of all, I, I must say thank you for all that you do. I know this is a challenging time to be in the medical profession, but I, I appreciate your time in coming on the show. I appreciate your show. Dr. O'Neill, we are just gonna dive in. This is a vaccine update that you're going to um, help us with. Tell us, first of all, what are the COVID costs for patients who are hospitalized? Well, so, you know, Right now, what's happening is that, you know, because COVID has cost so much for insurance companies, there's this shift where they're trying to shift the cost, more of the cost to the patient. But even right now, it's really expensive. So um, if you look at, can you bring up the slide with the COVID costs? I think it's slide 23. Yeah. So, I mean, some people, they'll spend like $30,000 in the hospital just for COVID. Now, if you need the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is basically the machine they put you on for, you know, kind of like a heart, you know, the heart, all heart surgeries, the patients get put on this machine, but they're also using it for really sick COVID patients. And so that therapy in itself is $5,000 a day. And that's, you know, maybe even on top of your other costs, like being in the intensive care unit, which you would need to be to even have that kind of therapy. Not all hospitals are doing it, but, you know, I was reading that one person who got really, really sick from COVID, his wife called all around and finally found, like she called 30 different hospitals, finally found a hospital where he could be essentially helicoptered out to or, you know, flown to that would do this therapy on him. And, you know, he's survived, but, you know, not everybody can afford to pay for this kind of thing. So, you know, if you are just hospitalized for COVID, suppose you have no insurance, then it's very, very costly. You'll spend like more than $200,000 on an ICU stay, you know, on the vent, or if you're in the hospital, it could be like $50,000, you know, with insurance, it's a little bit more reasonable, but it's still, you know, $20,000 for a hospital stay, depending on how long you stay. And, you know, more than $100,000 if you have an ICU stay. So, I mean, these costs, people aren't really realizing. And now the insurance companies, they're starting to try to pass on more of the, these costs to the patient because, you know, it's, it's been very costly and the insurance companies are in it to make money. So that's the unfortunate way things are. So, mm -hmm. so are, the, are these patients who have been hospitalized and run up bills like that for a couple of hundred thousand or, you know, in around $20,000, are they actually paying off their bills out of curiosity? I think a lot of them can. I mean, I think that, you know, that's another major problem that people are having. They're unable to pay these bills. So, I mean, and, you know, you could be able to pay it, but you might use all your life savings. So, I mean, that's another issue that people are having right now. So, I mean, it's something to consider, you know, maybe getting the vaccine for, because if you have the vaccine, you would be more protected, at least against severe illness. So you probably would not have to be hospitalized. I mean, it's not 100%, but you would have much less risk of hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Dr. O'Neill, does the Delta variant cause more infections or spread faster than coronavirus? The Delta variant is much more transmissible than the other variant that was here before, the Alpha variant. Right now in Hawaii and in the United States, the Delta variant is the most common variant. And so it's probably about two times or more transmissible than the alpha and people are getting more sick from Delta as well. So. So then what are some of the um, symptoms that people are suffering from in regards to the Delta virus? Can you go through some of them with us? Yeah. And are they, are they different from coronavirus symptoms? Well, I mean, the, so the coronavirus itself, the coronavirus is like a, a big group of viruses under which SARS-CoV-2 is under that. So, you know, the Delta virus is, I mean, a Delta variant is a variant of the 
uh, SARS-CoV-2. So, I mean, you have essentially the same symptoms, but you know, people are suffering from more severe illness. I mean, I know a few people who had alpha and then they thought they were pretty protected because you know they'd already had alpha and they thought, well, I have antibodies, but your immunity does wane after a while, right? But you know, then they felt pretty confident and even people who were vaccinated and then they got Delta and Delta really hit them very hard. You know, there was um, an article that was in the paper a little bit ago and she was a vegan, a young um, vegan, girl, very healthy, and she did not get vaccinated. And she was really surprised. She was, you know, in bed, very sick for 10 days. I mean, she didn't have to be hospitalized because she's, you know, completely healthy. But I mean, now she regrets not having the vaccine and a lot of other people too, because, you know, Delta tends to be more severe and people are having more symptoms. People who even had alpha before are having more symptoms than they did with the alpha. I'm interested to know because you did mention a young this young woman who recently were, you know was dealing with the variant are people who are hospitalized what's the what's the major age group are we are we talking younger well, people more younger people yeah, hospitalized so a lot or of people are there's many more younger people being hospitalized now than there were before and that's because right now a lot of the more old people are getting vaccinated because they realize they're at high risk. But a lot of the younger people, because originally with alpha and the, you know, the primary variants from earlier, people who are young weren't really getting sick because they didn't have a lot of medical problems. But now what's happening is because they're unvaccinated and they didn't think they would need to get vaccinated because they didn't think they would get sick, they're actually at higher risk because they don't have the antibodies there to protect themselves against Delta. So actually you know the the shift there's been a shift in the predominant age group and so we're seeing you know people i mean there are children but still not a lot of kids but there have been a lot of kids that are sick like 30 percent of the kids who get covid are really really sick and they're in they need intensive care unit care so i mean it's and you know a lot of these kids yeah they do have pre-existing illnesses but some of them don't i mean some some people who are 20 have died you know, and I've read this article about how there was an, um, this, these twins from India, they were in their 20s, they were healthy and they died. So, you know, for whatever reason, I mean, you don't know, you're kind of playing the lottery when you say, I'm healthy, I'm not going to get this. So, you know, I'm not going to get vaccinated because you don't know, even though you're healthy, there could be something we don't know everything about COVID yet. And we don't know everything about the Delta variant. So, you know, for whatever reason, you might still get sick, even though you're healthy. Now it is more common to get sick if you do have medical problems. So yes, there are people who are younger getting sick now, but a lot of them, they do have the same pre-existing conditions that were risk factors before, like high blood pressure, obesity, you know, and I would say probably a third of the population we have is even overweight. And even being overweight is a risk factor, you know, having high cholesterol, a lot of things that people just they don't even consider as medical problems. Those are risk factors for COVID. <laughs> you know, I, so. I think we, yes, I, th I, I think we do have a slide um, that lists some of the risk factors, a slide that you prepped for us. Yes. Here, here it is. So if you can just go through that again, yeah, Dr. Yeah, Anil. Well, um, let me, sorry, I just got a scroll. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I mean, the main risk factors are all these chronic conditions that people have, a lot of people in the United States. And I do want to highlight, you know, besides diabetes, heart disease, you know, having cancer, uh, you know, something that you might not think is a risk factor, but actually being pregnant is a risk factor too. So I know a lot of pregnant people are hesitant to get the vaccine because they don't know what kind of effects it has or, you know, it, they just you know, don't want to deal with the unknown, but actually being pregnant and getting COVID could be a lot worse. I mean, it is a lot worse. So, I mean, that is a risk factor for severe COVID. So, um, you know, anybody with lung disease, um, like I was saying, overweight people, uh, if you're born with something like a genetic defect, you know, like sickle cell disease, um, cystic fibrosis, any kind of immunodeficiency, and this is because your immune system can't mount a good response initially to fight COVID. These are all major risk factors. Dr. O'Neill, I do want to go get back to something that you just mentioned about pregnancy. Um, is it safe to, to get the vaccination 
while you're pregnant during your, during a pre pregnancy. Yes, and they do recommend it for a pregnant women. And actually, if you get the vaccine when you're pregnant, the great thing is that you can confer those antibodies to your child because right now it's not yet, you know, it's not yet approved for children to get the vaccine and especially not newborns. So if you get the vaccine, then you can confer those antibodies to your newborn child. So that would be something that you know, would protect your child because, I mean, a lot of people don't think about it, but I mean, I was reading these articles about how somebody got COVID and, you know, they weren't vaccinated and their child was not vaccinated because she wasn't in the age category that she could get a vaccine anyway, but her child got COVID and got really sick from it, you know? And so it's, it's just, it's just something to think about that you could be the one helping protect your child. I mean, it's rare that a child would have severe symptoms of COVID, but they do get other side effects. They could have long COVID. They could have um, Ms. C. We call it Ms. C. It's kind of like Kawasaki uh, disease where people have these, um, these cardiac um, you know, problems in the long run, which um, can be problematic for the, the rest of their life. So uh, you know, these are all things that people have to consider. I mean, it's, you know, even though a child doesn't get really sick from COVID, which is not a guarantee, like I said, it's like playing the lottery, but even if they don't really get sick, um, you can still have this other, you know, Ms. C happens about six weeks after you, the child gets COVID, you'll see them present with um, this syndrome. That's so many interesting points you bring up. I mean, when you think about it, people are all about trying to prevent illness in their lives, you know, during their lifespan. So it makes me wonder, like, what do you say to people who, who just are so against getting vaccinated but still live relatively health, healthy lives? Yes, I, I do think that is, I mean, I, I think this, you know, that's the reason I brought up that young girl who was vegan and healthy and she got COVID. People don't realize, I mean, yes, you are young and healthy and you could, you know, nine times out of 10, your body system is going to be able to fight COVID, but you can have these long-term side effects. Like when I mean, we talked about, I think a while ago, we did a COVID update episode. And we talked about how people get long COVID and they have these symptoms of shortness of breath for a long time, which might not be that they're actually having a low oxygen saturation that we require a hospital admission, but they have these symptoms that are bothersome for them. They feel like that they can't do the level of activity they are used to doing. I mean, there's some young athletes that get COVID and they're not able to, after months, months, you know, after they got COVID, which they should be cleared, you know, they're not able to return to their original activity, which is terrible, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, how about losing your sense of taste and smell? I mean, that kind of stinks. And it's not, not just losing it, you might gain it back, but then when it comes back, I was listening to the radio and someone said they had COVID. And then at first when it came back, it was a kind of like a, a metallic taste. So it was kind of like a bad taste. So, so, you know, that's a problem too, because I love eating and I'm sure you do too, as you're a chef. So I can't imagine losing my sense of taste or smell, although the losing the sense of smell might be helpful working in the emergency room, but <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yes, but taste, I don't want to lose my taste <laughs> absolutely not that's such a great point I mean I have actually people I know who have um, just recovered from it and they have said that it's been like over over eight months they still haven't got their sense of taste back mm -hmm. and are very very worried about whether it's actually going to you know come back and back to its normal um, normal sense it, it's scary gosh all of these and and the thing is, all of this can be, can be prevented with vaccination shot, which brings me into um, you know what some of the long COVID um, risks are that I do want to talk about after the break, Dr. O'Neill. But um, for now, we are going to take a short break for some messages. Please do stay stay tuned for this very you know important show, and uh, we'll be back shortly after these messages. Good afternoon, this is Howard Wig, 
the proud host of Code Green, a Think Tech Hawaii program. We air every other Monday from noon to 12.30. And my guests are subject matter experts in bringing Hawaii to 100% clean energy by 2045. And we're aiming not just at the electricity, but also at ground transportation. Exciting stuff. Please join me. Aloha and welcome back to Lillian's Vegan World. I'm your host, Lillian Kumik with Think Tech Hawaii. Um, I am very excited to have on the show Dr. Grace Chen O'Neill. And she, she and I are talking about the COVID update, the vaccines and, and the risks involved. Before then, I would like to briefly mention that I am a vegan chef and recipe developer, also cooking instructor, and my new uh, newly released cookbook is Hawaii, A Vegan Paradise, with over 120 plant-based recipes from the islands. My next book is going to be released, hopefully, this November, next month of 2021, and it is called Tasting Hawaii Vegan Style. Do look out for it. I would love to welcome back my regular guest on the show, Dr. O'Neill. Welcome back, Doctor. Thank you, Lillian. It's nice to be here. I appreciate your time. Let's just get right back into it. And uh, I want to ask you about the long COVID risks. We do have a slide. It's slide number six. Please yeah. tell us about this. So a lot of people, even though they get mild symptoms from COVID, they could have these lingering symptoms for months. And a lot of the symptoms have to do with, like I was talking about before, difficulty breathing. They could have a cough that lingers on, headaches. Um, then there's this thing called brain fog where they're not, they don't feel like they're thinking clearly. Uh, they could have lingering chest pains, uh, sleeping problems, dizziness, and they could have this you know, ongoing loss of sense of taste or smell. I had somebody, you know, one of the residents I know had it, had COVID and he's, you know, essentially a year after having it still couldn't uh, smell. So, um, you know, these are all things. Another thing is that um, COVID can change the menstrual cycle. And um, I know there's a lot of concern over if the COVID vaccine causes, you know, your um, fertility, to be affected, you know, decreasing your fertility or whatever, but uh, the COVID vaccine has not been shown to affect your fertility. Um, you know, if it did, then all the people who had COVID, their fertility would be affected as well. So we're not seeing that in uh, people who have COVID, uh, but it can, like the COVID vaccine, just like long COVID can change your menstrual cycle a bit just because uh, the immune system is involved in your menstrual cycle. So that's just something to note. That's actually a very scary thing. Yeah, I mean, um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I guess the immune system is, is involved in a lot of things that people don't realize the immune system is all over your gut because, you know, whenever you take in food, your immune system, it's like this foreign thing entering your body, even though, you know, it's supposed to nourish you, but there's some things that maybe you shouldn't be eating that are not nourishing you. So your immune system has to react to it. So uh, just like anything, you know, it affects mm -hmm. everything. Well then, Dr. O'Neill, let's talk about slide, slide 13 and the COVID-19 vaccine side effects. So you've, you've given us a little rundown on um, what happens if you do actually get the virus, but let's Let's compare it to the side effects from the vaccine. Yes, but, you know, most of the time, the side effects are pretty minor. Um, the most common side effect is just having pain and redness and swelling at the site of the injection. A lot of times people feel tired, have a headache, some body aches, you know, maybe a little bit nausea. But, you know, those are the main side effects. Now, People can have a life-threatening reaction called anaphylaxis. It's exceedingly rare. Apparently, this is, um, you know, at a rate of like 0.0005%, uh, you know, for the vaccine. So just, I mean, it's two to five people per one million people. It's just exceedingly rare that people get it. And if you do have anaphylaxis, it'll usually happen within 30 minutes of you getting the vaccine. So if you've had a problem with 
having another medication, getting anaphylaxis before, and you're hesitant, I would suggest that when you get the vaccine, you know, get it at a hospital and um, make sure to stay there 30 minutes if anything happens to you, you know, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is treatable um, and, you know, it's pretty rare that something like this would happen. So another side effect that they've been seeing with the mRNA vaccines is myocarditis or Oh, I spelled myocarditis wrong, sorry about that. <laughs> and pericarditis, which is happening in mostly young males, less than 30 and kind of like teenagers. I've seen one case. Um, these cases, they usually resolve spontaneously with, you know, don't really need much treatment really. Um, but, you know, like if you do get COVID, people can suffer from myocarditis and pericarditis of COVID. So, you know, I mean, that's probably going to be much worse than you having the vaccine and getting myocarditis from that, honestly. <laughs> was, um, and then another thing uh, people can have is Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is kind of like an ascending paralysis uh, usually. But this again is exceedingly rare, happens within two weeks of the vaccine. It's also an, a possible side effect of the flu vaccine, a possible side effect of getting you know, some kind of um, gastroenteritis or uh, diarrheal illness. People can get this as a problem too. So this is another thing that's rare. It's seen in the J and J. Um, so uh, that's you know one thing to note, but very, very rare as well. There's been 195 cases um, out of 14.5 million doses. Um, mm-hmm. And then I know a lot of people are, they've heard of the thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome. Um, this is mostly in women 18 to 49 years old. There's been 46 cases, and they're not really sure if it's increased from the population yet. Uh, but you know, um, it's it's probably it's I think it's something like 0.0007% of people who've had J and J vaccine who are getting this. But if you are hospitalized for COVID, apparently the risk of you being like bed bound, hospitalized for COVID, of you getting a clot in your leg or whatever, would be much higher, like 20%. So you're thinking like 0.0007% versus. 20%, then I would choose the 0.007% probably. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I must say I would too. I, I urge anyone watching the show to really take this all of this information in, into consideration because I am um, not a medical profession professional, but I, I am looking at the symptoms and side effects. And it looks to me quite clearly that um, getting vaccinated, the symptoms are far less and less less severe but you know we it's all about choices and it it really is your choice whether you want to get vaccinated or not um dr anil is some of the data that's coming out um true that the that the unvaccinated face 11 times more the risk of dying from COVID? yes yes I, i yeah it is true i mean there's Unfortunately, like I was saying before, you know, it used to be older people mostly who were dying of COVID, but now it's shifted to younger people unvaccinated. They have a much higher risk because they don't yet have antibodies to the, you know, the COVID. So they don't mount an immune response in time and the virus is able to kind of multiply and replicate really fast. And then they haven't yet begun their immune response. Whereas if you've been vaccinated, your immune system can already recognize the uh, COVID, and then it can go after it quickly and extinguish it before it becomes a real problem. And that's why vaccinated people also are not as transmissible. I mean, they can still transmit COVID, but they're not as transmissible as people who are unvaccinated. I mean, I will say I've seen in families, actually, I've had families come in, be tested, everybody, like, you know, the whole family comes in, they all have COVID like symptoms, but somehow the parents are negative and the children who can't get it the vaccine yet because they're too young are positive. I've had that happen a lot of times. So, I mean, I think that's because the parents, they're just mounting immune response really quick because they've already had the vaccine. And so they're extinguishing it, you know, whereas, you know, you have to wait for, you know, your body to develop immune response if you haven't seen it yet, you haven't recognized the foreign substance. In the state of Hawaii, what is the um, age at which a child can get vaccinated? Well, it's just like 
anywhere in the United States. Uh, right now, I think it's 12 and up, but they're working on like five to 12 right now. I think they've put in like a request or whatever. So um, maybe by the end of this year, I think they said. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you know if any of the schools are offering vaccine programs or trying to get some kind of um, support in schools for parents who, who are thinking about getting their children vaccinated? Um, that's a good question. I'm not quite sure, but I feel like a lot of places, there's a lot of free vaccine clinics, and I think a lot of the drugstores are offering it too. So I think that it shouldn't be an issue. I mean, the primary care doctors aren't offering it, but, you know, say like you go to Long's or, um, you know, Walgreens, whatever, they're all offering it. And all the hospitals are still offering it as well. We were talking about, and I don't know about at other hospitals, we were talking about trying to give people who come to the ER for other complaints, you know, who don't have COVID, obviously, but for other complaints, we were talking about trying to get them the vaccine in the emergency room. And I know like maybe Queens and some of the other hospitals might be able to do that, but we weren't able to institute that at Tripler. But at Tripler, people can just go in and then have the vaccine um, done. You know, they just need to make an appointment. So it, it's really, I feel like they're it's relatively easy, you know, mm -hmm. and you could sign up. I mean, I did the vaccination. I signed up my husband for it. So all you have to do is you go online and you can just Google search it. And then um, you fill out all the information and make an appointment for yourself when you show up. I don't know. <laughs> the access is there. I mean, I just walked into a long drugstore very yeah. randomly and asked if, asked if I could get it. I had ID with me and mm -hmm. 10 minutes later I was vaccinated. I did exactly the same thing for my second shot. So yeah. definitely it's a it's an easy sale as far as getting vaccinated. Dr. Anil, let's talk about the booster shot. Um, some people want to know if we need a booster shot, does that mean that the vaccine isn't working? Well, no, the vaccine is working. It is very protective against severe disease. Um, they are offering it to over 65 because people who are over 65, as you age, your immunity is not as strong as it was when you were young for multiple reasons. Like, you know, you develop more, you know, people can have malnutrition because they don't have access to food. You know, they may not be as ambulatory as they used to be. So multiple reasons, your immune system kind of declines. So your immune system isn't able to mount as strong of a response. So so um, they're, you know, concerned about those people, not, you know, they don't want those people to get sick. And then um, as, you know, time goes on, your immunity does wane a little bit. So that's why they are offering it at the eight month mark right now. Um, I don't know if it's going to, you know, be like that forever that will need a booster. But for right now, they are going to offer it to healthcare workers, residents of long-term care facilities, you know, nursing home residents, that kind of thing. Um, and people who are immunocompromised who can't mount a sufficient immune response are getting it. You know, people getting cancer treatments or who are on immunosuppressive medications. So um, it doesn't mean that it's not working. I mean, I think that obviously the it would work a lot better if more people had the vaccine because then we would have good herd immunity and the vaccine, um, you know, would kind of control the virus. So there wouldn't be as much of the virus circulating around and it wouldn't be able to mutate and, you know, have new variants like Delta and, you know, there's Lambda, there's Mu and there's all these other variants coming up. So if you have less of that being able to mutate in people, then that kind of controls it. But because a lot of people have chosen not to get vaccinated, it makes it difficult to get to herd immunity. So, yeah. Yes, I mean, it's all, it's a, there's a lot, of, a lot to take in when you consider getting vaccinated, getting the booster shot. There's also the social responsibility of whether you want to be part of trying to move forward um, yeah. with this. But I, I, I do agree that, you know, we all have choices. That's the beauty of living in a country like the United States. But the access is there. So, Dr. O'Neill, in your medical um, opinion, your professional opinion, do you advise the unvaccinated to get vaccinated for the COVID-19? And do you um, advise people who have been vaccinated to get the booster shots? 
Well, yeah, I definitely advise that people who are unvaccinated go get the vaccine. Now, there was hesitancy about recommending the booster shot just because the WHO, the World Health Organization, was saying we should try to get everybody vaccinated before we offer the booster. So um, that's why there was, you know, that backlash against that. But I do think if, you know, the booster is available for you, I think, yes, you should get it. You may protect yourself, especially if you're over 65, you're immunocompromised. Absolutely. If you're a healthcare worker, you know, you're constantly exposed. I don't want to give it. I don't want, I mean, I don't want to get COVID. I don't want to give it to my patients, you know, who are immunocompromised, who have medical problems. So, you know, that's why I'm getting the vaccine. So, mm -hmm. and I'll get the yes, I, offer it to me. So mm -hmm. again, uh, thank you so much for everything that you do. Please do stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us today on Lillian's Vegan World. To the viewers, stay safe also, stay healthy, and do please consider getting vaccinated if you haven't already. Aloha until next time. Thank you.